So here we are, Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 1. Solomon asked the question, who is like a wise man? And who knows the interpretation of a thing? Man's wisdom makes his face shine. The sternness of his face is changed. And so because man is fallen, the question would have to be asked, and if man is fallen, who can comprehend the meaning of life? There are few wise men, and there are few who are wise enough to speak concerning the word and the works of God. We need to remember that even as we begin our study that without God's revelation, no one can fathom life's meaning. Life's purpose and life's meaning is something that is revealed to us by the Lord. In Luke 10, 21, Jesus said it like that. It says, in that hour, Jesus rejoiced in the Spirit, saying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent, revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. You've hidden it from those who are wise and prudent in the ways of the world and have revealed it to those who are innocent and who will believe what you have to say. So when someone has proper wisdom, there's going to be a dramatic result. It's interesting how he says this in the second portion of verse 1. He says, a man's wisdom makes his face shine, and the sternness of his face is changed. And so even his appearance may change, sometimes for the better. You know, when you... I'll let you think about that for a moment. I'll tell you, when everybody was wearing masks, everybody was cute. Even, even Gollum had pretty eyes. So, <laughs> People under stress show the strain in their face. You've seen that. When people are under stress, you can pick it up. So when a person's ways are pleasing to the Lord and God is providing answers in life, even his appearance may change. He says his face will shine and the sternness of his face will be changed. When it says his face will shine, that speaks of his demeanor. It speaks of his outer appearance. His face will shine. In other words, joy will brighten his face. In, in Proverbs 15, 13, a merry heart makes a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart, the spirit is broken. And so when somebody is rejoicing and somebody is being blessed and all, the point he's making is if God reveals to you and gives you wisdom and you have the wisdom he gives to you, that even the sternness of your face will be changed to an appearance of joy because you now have an understanding of the meaning of life. He says in verse 2, I say, keep the king's commandment for the sake of your oath to God. Do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. And so he begins to give counsel here. I counsel you to keep the king's command. So he's speaking concerning our relationship to governmental authority. The king obviously would be a symbol of governmental authority. So he's speaking to us concerning our relationship to governmental authority. And so he's saying that you have options when, when commands are given. Uh, when a command is given by a government official, we'll say bringing it up to the 21st century, when we who live under the form of government that we live under are given a command, we can make some choices. We make decisions. We can first, we can disobey the orders, but we'll ultimately pay a price for doing so. We need to remember that. When somebody gives to us an order, when the government gives to us, and we as believers in the church will say, receive orders from the government that goes against our conscience, then we have to make some choices. We've seen this. Let me give you some things you're all familiar with. Um, we'll say that you own a bakery and you're asked to make a wedding cake for a same-sex couple. How are you going to respond? You have a conscience. And so how are you going to respond? The government has told you you need to do that, but your conscience has said that you can't approve of something that God doesn't approve of. So how do you respond when the government says you need to bake that cake? Or you're a teacher, and you've been ordered to teach young children LGBTQ plus every other letter of the alphabet curricula. 
What do you do as a teacher? You have been mandated. You have been commanded. You have been ordered to teach that subject. But it goes against everything within you. You've been told or commanded to have an inoculation. This happened not that long ago. And if you don't receive it and you're in the military, you'll be discharged. Or if you have a particular job that is saying you're required to do that, you may be fired. What do you do? The government has ordered you to take this particular uh, inoculation. Or you're a pastor like myself. You're told not to congregate. You're told that the church is not to gather together. And, and if you do, you have to have a separation and you can't sing praises to God. So what do you do? Well, in some churches, the people sing so bad, that's really a joy to not. <laughs> but what do you do? We've had this. We had somebody in our fellowship who was working at a school, uh, a school in the area, and they had their Bible on the desk, and they were ordered to take their Bible off the desk. What do you do? Do you remove the Bible because somebody said it's offensive, and yet in the library they can have all kinds of filth? What do you do? You see, those are questions you have to ask yourself. In matters of conscience, we have to make decisions, and our decisions are to be... Uh, based on our faith in Christ. Now, we've been going through the book of Acts. You'll remember this if you've been with us. There was a miracle that had taken place in the early, early chapters of, of Acts, and, and Peter and John had been at the gate called Beautiful, and while they were there, there was a crippled man. Remember that? And as uh, they were entering in during the hour of prayer, as they were walking in, the crippled man looks up to them. He'd been there for a long time. People knew this man. And as they're about to walk in, Peter and John are walking in, and you remember the story. The man looks up to them because Peter looks down and says, look upon us. So he calls, Peter calls the man's attention to himself. Look at us. And, and Scripture says very clearly, and the man looked up expecting to receive something. So when he looks up, he's expecting to receive an alms. He's expecting to receive a charitable contribution, a gift, a financial help for this man. And you remember what Peter said. He said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ. I say unto you, rise to your feet and walk. And the Bible says the man stood. He began to walk. He began to leap. And he began to praise God. And so this caused the, the religious authorities to get upset and all. And so they spoke to them. And, and uh, in Acts 4, 18 through 20, it says they called them, commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered and said to them, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. See, you decide whether or not for yourself obeying God is necessary. But as for ourselves, we will obey God. That's the whole point. So under ordinary circumstances, we are obligated to submit to proper authority That's because we're believers and we realize that our allegiance and, and our obedience to these uh, particular mandates or commands that are not violating our conscience are, are really representing our allegiance to our God. Because when he speaks here and, and he says in verse 2, uh, keep the commandment for the sake of your oath to God, your vow to God, we, uh, we realize that what he's saying here is, It's a, it's a way of revealing our true allegiance, our allegiance. And our true allegiance is not necessarily to human government. Our true allegiance is to the God who establishes it. In Colossians 3.23, whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. He says in verse 3, do not be hasty to go from his presence. Do not take your stand for an evil thing, for he does whatever pleases him. He's speaking here of the king doing what pleases him. So don't be hasty to go from his presence. Don't withdraw yourself from the king's service out of discontent or frustration. Do not persist in doing something wrong, obstinately rejecting his orders. And so how does that work? Well, in a practical way, dis disregarding orders. In a practical way, Uh, you have a problem that the deci uh, with a decision that your boss has made. He has made or she has made a decision that you just have a real difficult time. So you leave the room, and people begin to gather together. 
and they begin to complain and they begin to, to grumble. Well, he's, he would be saying in a practical way, instead of joining them, remember he's your boss or she's your boss, just do your job. Very often, by the way, your boss, your overseer, may have information you don't have. There are times that they have information that you're not privy to, that you don't have. They have it, you don't. And they make decisions based on what they know, what, not what I want. And so there are times that I may have disagreed with what my employer was wanting me to do. It wasn't against my conscience. It just wasn't something I, I thought was the right thing. So what do I do? Uh, I, I just follow the order, and I don't, I don't judge him. He says in verse 4, where the power of a king is, where the word of a king is, there's power. Who may say to him, what are you doing? Picture yourself saying that to, to the king. Hey, what are you doing? I don't think you'd get away with that. He's saying, listen, he says he, he has authority, and there's nothing you can do anyway. His word is going to carry more weight than your word. And if you're a servant, who's going to listen to you? They're going to listen to the king. So practically, he who keeps, uh, practically, uh, we just keep his, his word and all of that because it's the wise thing to do because where the word of a king is, there's power. And who may say to him, what are you doing? He has information, he has authority, and you don't have the right to question those things that he has that you don't have or don't know. He says in verse 5, he who keeps his command will experience nothing harmful. A wise, man heart discer wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. By following his orders, you're preserving your job. You're also avoiding problems. You're being wise. There's a real beautiful proverb. You might want to note this one, Proverbs 13, 3. He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. So this, this psalm here, Psalm 141, 3, I, I have it on, I've had it on my, uh, on my computer, on my uh, screen. Psalm 141, 3. Beautiful psalm. Set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Help me to keep my mouth shut. Help me not to speak without thinking. You see, in verse 5, a wise man's heart discerns both time and judgment. That means that we need discernment. Instead of, of me acting on my emotion, a wise person will wait until the proper time to act. Again, Proverbs 14, 29. He who is slow to wrath has great understanding, but he who is impulsive exalts folly. In James 1, 19 and 20. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. That's one of the things we need to remember because and there have been things done and it has We've had quite a number of things done recently that, that have caused me great frustration. Um, I've had to pray that the Lord would help me to guard the door of my mouth. And I've, I've asked the Lord to help me not to become so angry that I infect the church with anger. It's easy for a pastor to be upset at how things are going to the degree that in his messages he constantly complains about those things. And what happens is instead of encouraging the church to have faith, to do the best thing, to pray, look for opportunities to share, you can change the world through the gospel, things like that. We just get mad at everybody and mad at the government. There's hardly anything less attractive than angry Christians. That's true. There's hardly anything less attractive than bitter, angry, complaining Christians. Because the world has a chance to look at you and say, I thought you had the joy of the Lord. I thought the joy of the Lord is your strength. And you, you say, yeah, I enjoy hitting you in the head. You know, I mean, <laughs> I enjoy complaining. We have to be careful. There are quite a number of things, I won't go into this, but there are quite a number of things that I see that I, I really am affected by and that they really do, they do frustrate me and they do anger me. Quite a number of things. I mean, I watch the news, and I see things, and I get upset over them. But if I bring that anger and upsetness into this pulpit, I'm just going to have an angry church instead of a church that learns to pray, to evangelize, to share, to, to, to change. Um, you can change this world by being changed yourself, by having faith in God to know that he's in control, things of that nature. 
And so I really believe that we have to be very careful about those kinds of things. He says in verse 6, he says, For every matter there is a time in judgment, though the misery of man increases greatly. So discernment is used. It, it, it is exercise. It gives us wisdom as we make our, our decisions. And, and this is interesting what he's saying. He's saying things can get worse before we know what to do. Things can progress and even get worse to the point where we almost become hopeless. So refuse to act impulsively. Why? Well, verse 7, for he does not know what will happen. So who can tell him when it will occur? You don't know what the Lord is planning to do. So instead of getting ahead of him and making decisions that he may not be in, you learn to wait on the Lord. In the Old Testament, there's a book called the book of Nehemiah. It was written around 445 years before Christ. And Nehemiah um, contains an example of, of one who refused to act impulsively. When you read the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah was an officer in the court of the Persian king, a man by the name of Artaxerxes. And uh, he had received a report that the Jews in Jerusalem were in distress and, and were in reproach. The wall of Jerusalem had been broken down. The gates had been burned with fire. Now, this is something that tore into his heart. But instead of acting impulsively, the scripture tells us for many days he wept, he mourned, he fasted, and he prayed. And ultimately, Nehemiah stands before the king. The king says that there's a sadness in your heart. He says, and, he, he, and Nehemiah says, and I was greatly afraid. Why? Because never before had I been sad in the presence of the king. Well, what does that matter? He's a man, you're a man. You, you, you have a right to the times you feel bad. No, if you stood before the king as Nehemiah was, and you had sadness or grief in your heart, the king would take it personally and would have you killed. And that's why he says, I had great fear. Because the king said, this is nothing but sorrow of heart. What's your problem? And so he says, and so I prayed. He sought the Lord, and he gave his answer. Why wouldn't I be upset? I've received word about my home country. It's in disarray. And that's when the king gave him permission to go back and work on that city. And so had he acted impulsively, it wouldn't have turned out that way. Good example. Wait on the Lord. God will open the doors. He gives to you. He provokes you. He gives you that moment to speak. He'll give you the words. He'll give you the wisdom to know what to do. This is all basic Christianity. But instead of being impulsive, learn to wait. In Psalm 27, 14, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, verse 8, no one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power in the day of death. There's no release from that war. And wickedness will not deliver those who are given to it. Ultimately, he's saying, and this is very cheery, everybody's going to die. Let's let that sink in and then go home happy. No, I, everybody's going to die. We all know that. The older you get, the more aware of it you are. When you're very young, you're never going to die, right? But when you begin to accumulate days, months, and years, you begin to realize you've lived a long time. And ultimately, the day of death is before you, and you know that. So everybody's going to die. And everybody stands before God in judgment. And at that time, all of our decisions will be judged by the righteous and the fair judge. It, it has been said death is the great equalizer because all die and all deeds are examined. So Solomon is making it clear, death is the one thing that's inevitable. No one escapes it. Psalm 89, 48. What, can, uh, what man can live and not see death? Can he deliver his life from the power of the grave? Job 14, 4 and 5. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one. Since his days are determined, the number of his months is with you. You have appointed his limits so that he cannot pass. So what he's saying is no matter how powerful that person may be, he ultimately dies. That's the one thing we all have in common. Is it, a point, it is appointed unto men to die once and after this, the judgment. I've lived long enough to see quite a number of people, many of them, 
who had a lot of authority or a lot of renown. And they, like everybody else, they get to the point where they simply die. I've seen rulers who have died, been alive during the time of presidents dying and, and Russians who were premiers die and Chinese chairmen die. I've, I've seen a lot of powerful and I've seen a lot of influential die. The older I get, the more of, more of them I see dying. People that actually wrote into the, um, what would you be, in the, the musical score of my life. Every one of us, by the way, I, here we go, I'm going to wax eloquent on something you don't care about, but it's true, and I'll say it briefly. Marie and I talk about this. My wife and I talk about this every once in a while. We all have a musical score. I don't know what your musical score is. You know, who knows? I know what mine is. And so there are certain bands or people in groups that influenced me, and I've seen them die. You know, John Lennon die. Uh, George Harrison, die. You know, David Bowie, die. You know, so many. And uh, over time, you begin to see one thing, that everybody dies. And even if they made an influence in your life, they die. We'll see this in a moment, and very often are soon forgotten. So no matter how powerful a person may be, he ultimately dies. Now, in chapter 2, Solomon had already said this in Chapter 2, verse 16, he said, there's no remembrance of the wise man. There's no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die as a fool? Well, when he's saying this, and I'm going to make a little point when he says in verse 8 again, I want you to see this. He says, no one has power over the spirit to retain the spirit. No one has power in the day of, of death. Well, no one except one, Jesus. Jesus is the one who retained his spirit, and it's Jesus who relinquished his spirit to God. In Matthew 27, 50, it says, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up. The word yielded means he sent. He yielded up, he sent away his spirit. Jesus is the one who had the power to retain his life, and yet he didn't. He yielded it up. He sent, he dismissed his spirit. He said to his spirit, go. And he did that to win salvation for us. Because his words preceding the words, uh, uh, Father, I yield unto you my spirit. His words were, it is finished. So everyone dies and everyone will stand before the judge of the whole earth. So it's utmost importance that we stand before him clothed in the righteousness of God. We need to make sure where we stand with him because we all stand before him. And Paul said it very clearly. He said, we all shall give an account of ourselves to God. So ultimately, there is going to be a day of reckoning. And so it's very important for us to have our lives, <laughs> our sins cleansed by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. In verse 9, he says, all this I have seen and applied my heart to every work that is done under the sun. There is a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. All this, everything I've been speaking about, these are the things I've observed. I've learned from them. I've applied the lessons. I don't want to miss the meaning of my life. I, I observe things. You know, I really believe that it's important for us to not casually go through life, but to be an observer of our lives, to keep an eye on things around us, to learn from the things we go through. And so how we treat others uh, results in repercussions. You see, the scripture teaches from, from the one who has much, from him much will be required. So we reap what we've sown, either here or when we stand before the judge, because he said in verse 9, there's a time in which one man rules over another to his own hurt. And so we give an account of these things before the Lord. And then he says, verse 10, and I'm going to build on this for a little while in a moment. I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness. They were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This also is vanity. I want to talk to you for a moment, get, get kind of basic and kind of real. I saw the wicked buried, the one who had come and gone. Solomon is reflecting on a funeral that he attended. Remember in chapter 7, verse 2, he had said, it's better to go to the house of mourning than 
to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men. The living will take it to heart. It's better to go to a funeral than a party. We looked at that recently. Let me share a couple of thoughts about that once again, because when he says, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness, and they were forgotten. And I was 12 years old. I had a cousin. His name was Richie. I might have mentioned this recently somewhere. Maybe it was even to you recently. I don't remember. I talk so much. He was very close to me. He was my cousin through my mom's uh, sister, my Aunt Tilly. My Aunt Tilly um, had had uh, several children, and many of them from different men. And Richie was her only son. I think my aunt, and she was my favorite aunt. I loved her with all my heart, my Aunt Tilly. Richie, uh, Richie was the only son. He was about five or six years older than me. I don't remember anymore. But I do remember that my mom was greatly concerned for my cousin, Richie. So much so that she actually had him living with us for a little while, my parents did, because Richie was from a rough area in Venice. You know, sometimes when people think of Venice today, they may not know that there were sections of Venice, perhaps still are, that were, they were pretty rough. Venice could be rough, you know. Culver City, people look at it as being a nice place and all, and I guess in many ways it is. There's some pretty rough areas in Culver City, some old gangs. And in Venice, there were some old gangs. And my, my cousin Richie, Richie became a, a gangbanger. And he got in a fight. And somebody took a two-by-four and split his head open with it. And Mama told me, she said, you know, son, she goes, from that day, Richie changed. I still remember Richie because he would shave his head. He wore, he, he wore the garb at that time, you know. He shaved his head, and he had a scar, probably six, seven-inch scar on, on his crown. Well, one day, my mom told me, Richie died. Richie had become addicted to heroin. He and my other cousin, his sister, my cousin Linda, they had both gotten addicted to heroin. And he overdosed in a field and had been there for several days. Nobody knew. And they found him. And when they found Richie, his face had been consumed by ants. You know, he was very dear to us, very dear to me. And he had a, a, his funeral was closed, casket. They couldn't repair his face. And I was 12 years old, the first time I saw real sorrow, when I saw my Aunt Tilly laying on top of his caskets, screaming his name, and my uncles, who had to come and take her away from the casket. And it left an impression on this 12-year-old. But not that great. But I never forgot it. Then later on, as I was growing older, and the hippie movement was beginning, and drugs were becoming something everybody uses, I started losing friends. I was taking drugs, too, like everybody I knew. I started losing friends. I had a friend named Dave Smith. Dave and I used to hitchhike to the beach together before we had licenses. Then one day, Dave decided to take some reds, drink some wine and drop some acid, climbed on his motorcycle and drove headfirst into a parked pickup truck. His face went against the corrugated bumper and it was a closed casket once again. I had other friends that this started happening. I had a friend of mine who had been stabbed. He healed, but he was at a tasty freeze by Santa Fe Springs High School, Santa Fe. 
got into it with some guy. The guy stabbed him. And my friend's last words were, oh, no, not again. And he died. He's about 18 years old. I knew another guy by the name of Freddie Reyes when I was about 19. And Freddie ov- overdosed on of barbiturates and wine. He drowned in his own vomit. I used to deliver flowers when I was 18 for Whittier Florist. And I went to Rose Hills. And I used to have to take the funeral wreath and place them on the casket. And I read the card, the name of the person receiving the wreath. And I recognized it, and I said, oh, but that can't be my friend. He's only 18 years old. You can't imagine how I felt when I dropped this wreath on that, on that casket and looked into the face of a friend of mine that I'd been partying with just two weeks before. And then my friend Ray Casada, I grew up with him. We used to call him Monkey because he was ugly like a little monkey. <laughs> Everybody has nicknames, and he was Jungle. Ray was a good friend of mine from kindergarten. But he took a bad turn. He had one time I'd tried to be a surfer. Now he became Cholo. He's becoming a gangster. And he had a running problem with another guy named Pete. And there was going to be a party across the street from my house. And my mom said to me, son, I have a bad feeling. She used to use that phrase. I have a bad feeling. Please don't go to the party. Normally, I would ignore her. But I, I obeyed her. I went to somebody else's house. Went to visit a friend. My mama called me there. She said, Ray got shot in the head tonight. He got into it again with this guy named Pete. And a friend of mine named Mike, when he saw there was going to be a problem, went a couple of blocks from where the party was to his house, picked up his gun. And when Ray and Pete went into the back to fight, Ray was one of these guys, the way he fought was, he wasn't a boxer, he was a wrestler, so he'd he'd take you down. So he was about to take Pete down, from what I was told, when Mike fired his weapon and shot him in the head. He was like 18 years old. My friend Bill and my friend Jimmy and a couple of us went to Studebaker Hospital there in Norwalk. And he was in an ICU unit. And we looked into the window and we saw our friend all hooked up on these, these tubes. And a few days later, he attended his funeral. We had a friend, we used to, like I said, we used to give everybody nicknames. Called him Froggy because he was ugly. And I'll never forget him kneeling in the front of the church, loaded with his hands on the casket, crying for his best friend, Ray. Funerals have a way of awakening you, even at the age of 18, 17, 19, to the brevity of life. Tomorrow was promised to no one. It began to awaken me to that. One day I was at a pastor's conference in South Bay. Young man walked up to me and says to me, may I ask you a question? And I said, of course. He goes, did you grow up in Norwalk? Because he knew me as a pastor from here. I said, yeah, of course I did. Yeah, why? He said, I was listening to you on the radio. And you spoke about a guy named Ray Casada. I said he was one of my best friends. He goes, may I introduce myself to you? And I said, of course. He says, my name is Mike Torres. It's my father who shot and killed Ray. Mm -hmm. My father is the one who shot and killed Ray. Ray was his best friend. And I looked at Mike. And he said, you know what happened? I said, what? He said, did you ever hear anything of dad, my dad? I said, not since they put him away. 
He said, my dad did a lot of years in prison, Pastor David. He said, but he said, while he was away, I got saved. And I'm an assistant pastor. He's now the pastor of a Calvary Chapel. He says, I'm assisting. He became the pastor. He says, and my father's out now. Spent 30 some years in prison. And he said, and he's serving the Lord at my church. He said, and I, I've heard your story. I wanted to give you the ending of it. So I've been meeting with Mike Torres, the pastor now, from uh, Into the Light Ministries in La Habra, Calvary Chapel, for years. See, so you never know what tomorrow brings. You never know. And, and death has a way of awakening us to the reality of the shortness of our life. And, and, and Solomon is speaking about that. And, and many of us in this room, I, I know just by, by just the chances or the odds, many of you have stories very similar to what I've given you, and even worse. You've seen even worse. Even worse. But God. But God broke into our lives, right? But God changed things in us. And, and we have hope because of that. But my whole, my, whole, my whole journey began by seeing how short life is. And by going to these funerals, even as Solomon is speaking, he said, I saw the wicked buried who had come and gone from the place of holiness. And they were forgotten in the city where they had so done. This, he said, it's also vanity. It's interesting as he's taking notice of the person who is being buried he says someone had come and gone. Notice from the place of holiness. When he says that, the place of holiness may be referring to a position of a judge who administered the law in the city. The place of holiness would be speaking about having the authority of God when he made a judgment. In Deuteronomy 19.17, it says the accuser and accused must appear before the Lord by coming to the priests and judges in, in office at that time. So the place of holiness spoke of them representing God in the judgment God is bringing. And this judge is described as wicked, which means that he's an unrighteous judge. In other words, he'd been given a sacred duty, but he didn't honor the office. And he had a funeral. The funeral had great fanfare, but he's saying he was quickly forgotten because he was evil. He was forgotten because his life was not worthy of even being remembered. Now, that's something that sobers me. I don't want to have a life that is so pointless and useless that nobody even remembers that I existed. And he's saying, I saw that. He said, this is vanity. In verse 11, because the sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Now, that connects the thought that was just expressed. It speaks of people knowing that the official was evil and, and noticing that he got away with it. And, and it means that people can see that God delays judgment of the guilty, and it can lead people to think that God doesn't deal with sin. And that's a mistake because it can cause you to become hardened in your own sin. What happens is man may begin to see that God doesn't move on this, therefore this must be something permitted by God. God's grace in not, in not judging them immediately is mistaken for permission. Well, grace is never permission for rebellion. In Romans 6, 1 and 2, he says this. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? And so this is resulting in a weakening of faith in God's warning of judgment. And it results in man denying moral responsibility for what he's done. Just as he's saying didn't fall immediately, so it must be permissible. In reality, this simply adds to the sins that he's going to be held accountable for. You know, people can go to church, even habitually, and remain unchanged in the way they live. And instead of learning and hearing and being warned and equipped, they become prideful. So the basic thing is, this is so important. Deal with sin quickly. Don't let it become entrenched. Someone once said this, sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, 
reap a destiny. Deal with sin quickly. Don't let it fester. He's saying when people get away with crime, they commit even more. In verse 12, though a sinner does evil a hundred times and his days are prolonged, yet I surely know that it will be well with those who fear God, who fear before him, but it will not be well with the wicked, nor will he prolong his days, which are a shadow, because he doesn't fear God. Sometimes, and this is true, sometimes evil people live longer and they seem to get away with so much evil. Isn't that true? You see, you say, that little scoundrel, how does he continue? <laughs> Why do the good die young? Right? You know, I've had that question many times myself when I've performed funerals, including those, of, those whom I love, my own family. Good people, and yet there's this these scoundrels, and you wonder, how come? Well, don't take God's patience for granted. Don't mistake it for approval or permission. Why? Because he gives some people ample time to repent. In 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's one of the things the Lord has really taught me about that. Because I, I'm not kidding you, you know, because I've, I have performed enough funerals for people I love deeply, and they were young. My father was 74 when he died. He's, he, he died. I'm one year younger than my father when he died. I considered him at that point in his life someone who should live longer. 74? 74? And then you see these other guys who, who booze it up and crowds around and have all kinds of habits. And I began to wonder, Lord, why, why do you allow those people? And you took my father. And you know, I'll be real with you about that. Why did, why, why? And it finally came to me because God is gracious. He gives people a long time to repent. My father had repented, served him, loved him, and he took him home to be with him. My father wouldn't want to come back to this place, right? And it finally made some sense. You see, even if he lives a long time, he, his life is still just a shadow. In, in James 4.14, what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and vanishes away. He says in verse 14, there is a vanity which occurs on earth. There are just men to whom it happens according to the work of the wicked. Again, there are wicked men to whom it happens according to the work of the righteous. I said, this is vanity. Wicked people sometimes get the praise that should be reserved for the good. Now, sometimes it seems, and this is something Solomon would possibly say, you know, sometimes life doesn't seem fair. You ever hear that from your kid if you're a parent? Isn't it interesting how just they are? When they're children, that's not fair. You know, he got more ice cream than me. That's not fair. I remember saying that one time to my mother. I looked at my brother's ice cream. I looked at mine. In my righteous little mind, I weighed it. And I said, that's heavier than mine. And, and I let my mom know because she was dealing unjustly with me. And so she showed me justice. She took my brother's ice cream and my ice cream and threw it down the sink. <laughs> and she said, you're going to complain, you get nothing. So I learned a long time ago, let God take care of these things. Because <laughs> sometimes it just doesn't seem fair. In verse 15, I commended enjoyment because a man has nothing better under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. And this, is, uh, this will remain with him in his labor all the days of his life, which God gives him under the sun, when I applied my heart to know wisdom and to see the business that is done on earth, even though one sees no sleep day or night, I saw all the work of God, that a man cannot find out the work that is done under the sun. For though a, man's labors to, a man labors to discover it, yet he will not find it. Moreover, though a wise man attempts to know it, he will not be able to find it. And so... Instead of becoming frustrated over unfairness, learn to simply enjoy life. 
It's been said the wheel of justice turns slowly. So don't wonder why people go unpunished. Learn to enjoy life for what it is. Allow God to sort it out with people. Again, I, I've often wondered why people seem to get away with so much. I remind myself of uh, what took place in the Gospel of John when the Lord Jesus Christ said to, uh, to Peter when you were young, and I'm paraphrasing, when you were young, you would dress yourself and go where you want. When you're old, someone will dress you and take you where you don't want to go. And, and then John adds to us and says, he's speaking about the way he'd glorify God through his death. But what is Peter's response instead of saying, Oh, really? He goes on to say, and seeing the one whom Jesus loved, he said, well, what about him? And God told me a long time ago to listen to the answer Jesus gave because Jesus said, what has he got to do with you? You follow me. When you learn to do that, you'll be okay. But when you're so busy sitting around saying, how come you haven't chopped his head off yet? And why does that person seem to get away with it? How come? Well, instead of worrying about this, just enjoy the fruit of your, of your, your hands and, and enjoy the Lord. He'll sort it all out. He says in verses 16 and 17, finally, uh, I applied my heart to know wisdom. As the wisest man alive, he understood life's beyond comprehension. It's been said, our knowledge is a receding mirage in an expanding desert of ignorance. So God doesn't expect us to know that which is unknowable. There are many things that we can't expect to ever know. And an awareness of my own ignorance is a step towards acquiring knowledge. So wisdom is important to the one who wants to get the most out of life. Pursuing wisdom should be our goal, realizing there will always be more to learn. If, you, if I were to tell you one of the things in my own life that I've asked the Lord to increase, it's been wisdom. Lord, I don't want to have wisdom. I want to have not only knowledge, but I want to know how to practically apply it to situations. I want wisdom. Because there are a lot of people who are educated beyond their understanding. So I, I don't want just information and knowledge. I want to know how to rightly apply that. I want to know how to do that. So pursuit of wisdom is a goal. There's always more to learn. Proverbs 4, 7 will close with this. Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. So we'll close here. And we'll pick up next time in chapter 9.